King Cool Books, episode 12, You Ought to have Stayed Below. Welcome back, this is Wesley Schantz. The Game Cool Books series on The Golden Compass by Philip Pullman continues this week with chapter 9, The Spies. Let's see how Lyra deals with the frustration of not being allowed to go with the Egyptians to the north. Could it be by going with the Egyptians to the north? Could it be once more by recourse to stories? Over the next few days, Lyra concocted a dozen plans and dismissed them impatiently, for they all boiled down to stowing away. And how could you stow away on a narrow boat? To be sure, the real voyage would involve a proper ship, and she knew enough stories to expect all kinds of hiding places on a full-sized vessel. The lifeboats, the hold, the bilges, whatever they were. But she'd have to get to the ship first, and leaving the fens meant traveling the Egyptian way. And even if she got to the coast on her own, it might she might stow away on the wrong ship. It would be a fine thing to hide in a lifeboat and wake up on the way to high Brazil. At least one thing stories are about is seeing the world as the sort of place that admits of the possibility of stories. Like her imagination of the sword fight, though, Lyra's plans here founder on the limitations of reality. Until she makes it to the seagoing ship, how can she expect to find hiding places? Her very ignorance here, though, gives her that much more hope that something whose nature she does not know may yet serve her purposes. She may yet think of a way to get there to whatever bilges are. It turns out they're the very lowest part of the ship, where the two sides meet above the keel. We might recall her fascination with voyages and her belief in the bung, which got her into so much trouble and caused such embarrassment for the Costas. Her imagination contains its own dangers, too, as suggested by the mention of High Brazil. The South will be a presence in this chapter, but this name, spelled with H-Y and other variants, can apparently also refer to a mythical island west of Ireland. At any rate, it signifies a case of overshooting rather than failing to reach her destination. Meanwhile, all around her, the tantalizing work of assembling the expedition was going on day and night. She hung around Adam Stefanski, watching as he made his choice of the volunteers for the fighting force. She pestered Roger Van Poppel with suggestions about the stores they needed to take. Had he remembered snow goggles? Did he know the best place to get Arctic maps? These leaders, who looked at her from the parley room, now put up with her antics, but not much, and they're only lightly sketched in. The most interesting one, the spy, Benjamin de Reuter, um, who's made that much more intriguing by his absence, will soon drop out of the story entirely. But other spies of various kinds and species will be fairly prevalent throughout his dark materials, up to and including the tiny dragonfly riding Galavespians in the final book. Their frequent reference that Pullman makes when speaking of his sheepish affinity for fantasy elements alongside his aspirations to serious realism. Those best Arctic maps figure, I think, in both of the little books that he released between the original trilogy and the new Book of Dust in Lyra's Oxford and Once Upon a Time in the North. You both see such maps. And as for goggles, goggles for snow instead of for swimming, they certainly conjure up the North as if it were another element, a compound of cold and snow, as immersive as being underwater. We see Lyra claiming knowledge and expertise in an effort to make it there, to be allowed to come along, hoping and putting herself forward childishly, earnestly, desperately. I think it'd be best if I helped you, Father Coram, she said because I probably know more about the gobblers than anyone else, being as I was nearly one of them, and probably you'll need me to help you understand Mr. de Reuter's messages. He took pity on the fierce, desperate little girl and didn't send her away. Instead, he talked to her and listened to her memories of Oxford and of Mrs. Coulter and watched as she read the alethiometer. Though she bothers the others, she keeps talking to Father Coram because he listens and talks back. His pity will be a big theme in the chapter. Here, it's establishing a solid teacher-student relationship for tutoring 
and the mentions of Heidelberg and Bodley's library suggest they both remember such scholarly arrangements fondly and proudly. We might wonder if this is what Egyptian school looks like, how those leadership roles, delegations of duties, customs, family demons and feuds and jealousy of ancestral rights all get passed down. If Lyra ain't Egyptian, as Mark Costa reminds her, Father Coram seems to be something more than most Egyptians, more versed in the worlds of scholarship and politics that Lyra has also moved in a little, and to which she is called as belonging. Her pride in Bodley's library overtakes what might seem a natural question at this point. When was Father Coram in Heidelberg? What was he doing there? But well, don't get all the stories. For all Lyra's curiosity about some things, she's less interested in others. You might remember that dust doesn't collect on children, at least not much. One main object of her attention shows us more about the relationship between humans and demons, which we've been very interested in, but which hasn't come up much directly in a while. She could hardly take her eyes off Fartacorum's demon, who was the most beautiful demon she'd ever seen. When Pantalaimon was a cat, he was lean and ragged and harsh, but Sophonax, for that was her name, was golden-eyed and elegant beyond measure, fully twice as large as a real cat and richly furred. When the sunlight touched her, it lit up more shades of tawny, brown, leaf hazel, corn, gold, autumn mahogany than Lyra could name. She longed to touch that fur, to rub her cheeks against it, but of course she never did, for it was the grossest breach of etiquette imaginable to touch another person's demon. Demons might touch each other, of course, a fight, but the prohibition against human-demon contact went so deep that even in battle no warrior would touch an enemy's demon. It was utterly forbidden. Lyra couldn't remember having to be told that. She just knew it, as instinctively as she felt that nausea was bad and comfort good. So although she admired the fur of Sophonex and even speculated on what it might feel like, she never made the slightest move to touch her, and never would. Little seeds are planted there. The, the word uh, elegant and uh, nausea might both recur to us later. Um, Sophonax's name is one of the few demon names we get. That connotes wisdom, of course. And this utterly forbidden thing might make us think of a few other forbidden things. Uh, the prohibition against touching another's demon being called etiquette then also ties it in with themes of manners on the one hand, custom on the other. It suggests a deep source for all these, an innate, instinctive sense of right and wrong. She just knew it. The description of the colors in her fur recalls the light imagery used of Fadakorm's smile and of reading the alethiometer, the mountains that appear. We'll see them again. It also foreshadows the way Will's demon, described in the amber spyglass much later, even in that final book, Pullman is still revealing more about demons and their relationships to people, and there he adds an important modification to this great taboo. But we can see here at least part of what it means to lay hands on another's demon, what that might mean to manipulate their attention, to invade their innermost secrets, or usurp their conscience. It must be a monstrous arrogance. With such a beautiful demon, and Father Coram must be an exceptional person. No doubt he is different from Lyra's other teachers, Mrs. Coulter with her sweetness masking steel, or the absent-minded scholars. Father Coram combines the better aspects of both. He lavishes time and attention on Lyra, and he knows enough to help her along in her own investigations of the alethiometer without stifling her. What's that hourglass mean, Father Coram? She asked over the alethiometer one sunny morning in his boat. It keeps coming back to that. There's often a clue there if you look more close. What's that little old thing on top of it? She screwed up her eyes and peered. That's a skull. So what do you think that might mean? Death? Is that death? That's right. So in the hourglass range of meanings you get death. In fact, after time, which is the first one, death is the second one. Do you know what I noticed, Father Corm? The needle stops there on the second go-round. On the first round, it kind of twitches, and on the second, it stops. 
Is that saying it's the second meaning, then? Probably. What are you asking it, Lyra? I'm thinking. She stopped, surprised to find that she'd actually been asking a question without realizing it. I just put three pictures together because I was thinking about Mr. de Reuter, see, and I put together the serpent and the crucible and the beehive to ask how he's getting on with his spying, and why them three symbols? Because I thought the serpent was cunning, like a spy ought to be, and the crucible could mean like knowledge, what you kind of distill, and the beehive was hard work, like bees are always working hard. So out of the hard work and the cunning comes the knowledge, see, and that's the spy's job. And I pointed to them, and I thought the question in my mind, and the needle stopped at death. Do you think that could be really working, Father Coram? It's working all right, Lyra. What we don't know is whether we're reading it right. That's a subtle art. I wonder if... After the anchor, back when Father Coram first explained the alethiometer, the first symbol whose meaning we get discussed is the hourglass with its skull. This and a later scene of them reading the alethiometer aboard the boat are continuations of that earlier discussion about layers of meanings, how the alethiometer works, and how Lyra becomes conscious of them. The first meaning of all was hope, but the first we see Lyra become aware of reading is death, closely related to time, and, of course, to cunning of the serpent, distillation knowledge and hard work with the beehive all seem very significant. We can fairly trace both these meanings, hope and death particularly, that is, in the story of the creation and the fall at the start of Genesis, and within the golden compass, one might remember the severed head Lord Azrael shows, and the skulls in the catacombs, or even Father Coram's skull-like face. Farquhar's question here makes Lyra aware that she was asking a question without realizing it. His trust in the devices, like a reader's trust in a great text, or players in the rules of a game they want to play, a necessary foundation to start from, and a form of humility on the part of the individual. His further speculation, I wonder if, gets cut off here, like Pan was interrupted on the rooftop, like the master was interrupted just when he might have said something more about the alethiometer and Lord Asriel, or even the way Adele Starminster, the journalist, was cut off by Mrs. Coulter at the cocktail party. In fact, each instance I can remember of someone being interrupted and their words being cut off seems traceable to her and the gobblers. This is no exception. The young man led them to a boat tied up at the sugar beet jetty, where a woman in a red flannel apron held open the door for them. Seeing her suspicious glance at Lyra, Father Corm said, It's important the girl hears what Jacob's got to say, mistress. So the woman let them in and stood back, with her squirrel demon perched silent on the wooden clock. On a bunk under a patchwork coverlet lay a man whose white face was damp with sweat and whose eyes were glazed. Once more, we have Lyra getting in where she ordinarily wouldn't be allowed. And that squirrel demon on the clock, that's a detail I never noticed before. It's reminiscent of the skull atop the hourglass, of course. But also of a few other literary clocks, the one on the mantelpiece in Nick's cottage in The Great Gatsby, or the one in Bilbo's Hobbit Hole. Associations of passing time with issues of missed opportunities, nearly missed opportunities. The question of how the secondary world of the story maps onto the historical real world we might experience, and of its internal continuity and coherence. These are all interesting, interesting questions which are alluded to here so lightly. Speaking of which, I realize I'm jolted out of the story experience here by a couple of technical questions which, understandably, no one in the story really asks, which I never really thought of until reading and rereading the story this slowly. How did Jacob get back from the mis Ministry of Theology in London? What about those checkpoints the Costas had to pass through? Or did he come another way by sea somehow? Uh, at any rate, it stretches credulity. But dramatically and thematically, the story he and his demon tell permit us to hear... Uh, 
something wonderful here. What happened? said Father Coram. Benjamin's dead, came the answer. He's dead. Gerard's captured. His voice was hoarse and his breath was shallow. When he stopped speaking, his demon uncurled painfully and licked his cheek, and taking strength from that, he went on, We was breaking into the Ministry of Theology, because Benjamin had heard from one of the gobblers we caught that the headquarters was there. That's where all the orders was coming from. He stopped again. You captured some gobblers, said Father Corm. Jacob nodded and cast his eyes at his demon. It was unusual for demons to speak to humans other than their own, but it happened sometimes. And she spoke now. We caught three gobblers in Clerkenwell and made them tell us who they were working for and where the orders come from and so on. They didn't know what the kids were being taken, except it was north to Lapland. She had to stop and pant briefly, her little chest fluttering before she could go on. And so them gobblers told us about the Ministry of Theology and Lord Boreal. Benjamin and said him and Gerard Hook should break into the ministry and Franz Brokeman and Tom Mendham should go and find out about Lord Boreal. Did they do that? We don't know. They never came back. Father Coram, it was like everything we did, they knew about before we did it. And for all we know, friends and Tom were swallowed alive as soon as they got near Lord Boreal. Come back to Benjamin, said Father Coram, hearing Jacob's breathing getting harsher, seeing his eyes close in pain. Jacob's demon gave him a little mew of anxiety and love, and the woman took a step or two closer, her hands to her mouth. But she didn't speak, and the demon went on faintly. Benjamin and Gerard... Well, just to back up for a moment, the ferret demon speaking to them is unusual and remarkable, even in this life and death situation. And her story, so rich and descriptive, strains such realism as we might still look for in the fact of a talking animal, but it asserts the importance of the full story, even above the strain on the dying man's demon to tell it in such detail. The spy's death is not in vain as we glean some important information about the kids being taken north to Lapland, and about Lord Boreal's leadership and sway, there's an unsettling suspicion. It's like they knew before they did it. Could there be more spies here than the Egyptians? A mole? A counter-spy? Even another alethiometer? Now to go on. Benjamin and Gerard and us went to the ministry at White Hall and found a little side door, it not being fiercely guarded, and we stayed on watch outside while they unfastened the lock and went in. They hadn't been in but a minute when we heard a cry of fear, and Benjamin's demon came a-flying out and beckoned to us for help and flew in again, and we took our knife and ran in after her, only the place was dark and full of wild forms and sounds that were confusing in their frightful movements. We cast about, but there was a commotion above and a fearful cry, and Benjamin and his demon fell from a high staircase above us, his demon a tugging and a fluttering to hold him up, but all in vain, for they crashed on the stone floor and both perished in a moment. I couldn't see anything of Gerard, but there was a howl from above in his voice, and we were too terrified and stunned to move, and then an arrow shot down at our shoulder and pierced deep down within. demon's perception of the scene in the ministry is almost surreal. And the old idea that upon death there's a judgment, a rendering of account, connected with the atavism that in us our life and choices matter, whether beyond in an eternity or simply here for those we leave behind, we are all evoked by the direct communication by the demon, the remarkable content of her story. It's not the first and not the last death that we'll see this fall from a high place, crashing to the floor. Pulling back the covering and seeing the wound and the end of the arrow protruding, recalls the other deaths Lyra witnessed in chapter 6, and both of these point ahead to an important arrow later in the series, other dramatic deaths. The showing of wounds is a confirmation of prowess, of bravery, as in Shakespeare's Coriolanus, or as testaments to identity, as the scar of Odysseus triggers that further story and his recognition by the nurse in the Odyssey, all these hover in the background here. The immediacy of the wound brings those who weren't there 
into contact with the story. And in this case, it's rather gruesome. Along with the glimmer of hope that Lyra can indeed learn to read the alethiometer, and the immediate knowledge gained here, as in the story of the fall, is knowledge to do with mortality. The night ghasts that came for Lyra when she switched around the skull's coins are recalled briefly, explicitly, in the interlude which follows. As she reflects here, something we don't often see her doing, Lyra is tossing mud into the water. But how differently than when she and her cronies attacked the brightly painted Costa boat, what feels like so long ago. Mud and dust are not so far apart, and this seems to be what the discussion she has with Pan is leading up to. Lyra supposes a spirit guides the needle, and she considers throwing it away, Excalibur-like. Pan counters with his ability to see spirits, like a ghost in Godstow, to go with the werewolf we heard about before. They wrangle over what they can and can't, and haven't, haven't seen. He says it was only a night ghast, presumably a nightmare. She says it was a proper spirit. At last, Pan pro proposes his alternative explanation. Maybe it's elementary particles. And again, he cites an example of the photo mill, which the narrator goes on to read as if arbiting, at least, I think that's what you can hear in the way Philip Pullman reads it aloud, like saying, well, you might have a point. At Gabriel College, there was a very holy object kept on the high altar of the oratory, covered, now Lyra thought about it, with a black velvet cloth, like the one around the alethiometer. She had seen it when she accompanied the librarian of Jordan to a service there. At the height of the invocation, the intercessor lifted the cloth, to reveal in the dimness a glass dome inside which there was something too distant to see, until he pulled a string attached to a shutter above, letting a ray of sunlight through to strike the dome exactly. Then it became clear. A little thing like a weather vane, with four sails black on one side and white on the other, that began to whirl around as the light struck it. It illustrated a moral lesson, the intercessor explained, and went on to explain what that was. Five minutes later, Lyra had forgotten the moral, but she hadn't forgotten the little whirling veins in the ray of dusty light. They were delightful, whatever they meant, and all done by the power of photons, said the librarian as they walked home to Jordan. So perhaps Pantaliman was right. If elementary particles could push a photo mill around, no doubt they could make light work of a needle, but it still troubled her. So, Lyra notices the detailed velvet cloth something tactile and immediate to her, just words on the page to us, but it would help us to make that connection. And once you start to read such connections, you'll see echoes and patterns like this everywhere in this book, as in any great story or poem. And that's handy not just for writing essays or arguing with your friends, but for deepening your enjoyment. As the narrator says on Lyra's behalf, she remembers her fascination at the ray of dusty light, but forgets the moral. It's easy enough to derive any number of morals and interpretations from a story so long as they're grounded on careful, and I think voluntary, reading. Appealing to photons, as the librarian accounts for the phenomenon, partly explains it. It's something more than saying it's a spirit, but it leaves out the other aspect of light. It's wave-like, dual, mysterious nature, very like the dual nature embodied in humans and demons. So I think Lyra and Pan may well both be right, but we'll have to wait a while to find out for sure. In the meantime, we're left with the sense of delight, the impression of curiosity about to shape itself into questions. Just what Lyra felt on first looking at the alethiometer in her room at Mrs. Coulter's. That delight is compatible with, perhaps inseparable from, seeking understanding. It seems to be Pullman's overriding moral which is very interesting, and again, helps to elevate his work beyond, above the ideological fray, and though in other respects he seems perfectly willing to descend into it and swing roundhouses with the likes of Chesterton, Lewis, Tolkien, God. As we might have guessed, Jacob does die. The story by itself is enough confirmation of the alethiometer's power, and of Lyra's, to describe its meaning. So John Fa unwilling as he is, decides on taking her along after all. 
with a nod once more to that Egyptianness which she is protected by yet shut out from. We hear that Jacob is buried according to custom, but we get no description of what that would look like, epic as it sounds. And not that she needs it at this point. John Foss says anyway to Lyra, the coming along is not an occasion for joy and jubilation. Somehow, her delight at reading and remembering, asking questions and gaining knowledge must be tempered by the fundamental truth death. The mystery of how the alethiometer works and the promise of further danger and suffering. This is all tension we have to live with. Under Father Coram's wing, it might be a little more bearable, but John Faw's wrath is there in the background to keep her on her best behavior. With the description of the journey, the dismal autumn landscape, Lyra not being allowed out, we can appreciate the compression of time, of days, into representative sentences. We're reminded that another of the great powers of storytelling consists in what it leaves out, the way the narrator has of keeping the description limited to what's of immediate relevance to Lyra's experience. Thus, we can more easily trace the overall movement from the sunshine and Father Coram's boat to this smoky dimness, continuing and drawing out the crampedness of the Costa's boat foreshadowing greater darkness, atmospheric and thematic, to come. In a variation on that earlier trip with the Costas and of the stories which surround the gobblers, we hear more gossip about Lyra, rumors that she's the only child escaped from the gobblers, that she and Pan are a pair of spirits sent by infernal powers. She's a Tartar spy. Her reaction wanes from glee to despondency as her self-consciousness increases. With the mention of people hating and fearing her, we could infer something of the author's hopes or fears for the impact these books will have upon his reputation. And between longing to be north already or to be back in Jordan, wishing that she had already arrived at her destination or that nothing had changed, we get a close echo of passages from chapter 3. And in these wishes to be north, to be back in Jordan, we see that they are, of course, contradictory to one another. But that's the prerogative of the wish, as it's the prerogative of stories to grant them. Reading is what draws her out of her boredom. Reading and discussion. The one thing that drew her out of her boredom and irritation was the alethiometer. She read it every day, sometimes with Father Coram and sometimes on her own. And she found that she could sink more and more readily into the calm state in which the symbol meanings clarified themselves and those great mountain ranges touched by sunlight emerged into vision. That image becomes a shorthand for a whole world of experience, which, after all, no matter how much we might say about it, can only be pointed towards symbolically. Connecting to something in our own experience, like the reading of this story, or the writing of one of our own, we can recognize what Lyra experiences here and aspire to more fully embody it ourselves. And then as far as possible, Lyra does explain what it's like reading the instrument. She struggled to explain to Father Coram what it felt like. It's almost like talking to someone, only you can't quite hear them. And you feel kind of stupid because they're cleverer than you, only they don't get cross or anything. And they know such a lot, Father Coram, as if they knew everything, almost. Mrs. Coulter was clever. She knew ever such a lot. But this is a different kind of knowing. It's like understanding, I suppose. Like talking to someone you can't quite hear, but knowing they know almost everything. Behind this distinction between Mrs. Coulter's knowing and elithiometric understanding lies a whole array of philological, philosophical, scientific considerations. The romantics with their rediscovery of and emphasis on more felt modes of thinking after the rigors of enlightenment, the distinction in many languages between informational knowledge and relational knowledge, and to an extent, theories about different hemispheres and parts of the brain and their functions. But just to stay within the story, we can see a lot simply in Lyra's comparison between Mrs. Coulter's sort of knowing and the sort she calls understanding. If we wanted a character to range alongside it, as a representative opposed to Mrs. Coulter. Lyra's probably the best, but Father Coram would be a good one too. Though as we see, they aren't perfect. 
In Father Quorum's case here, it's his good intentions that get the best of him. Lyra, it's her sort of desire. He would ask specific questions, and she would search for answers. What's Mrs. Coulter doing now, he'd say. And her hands would move at once, and he'd say, Tell me what you're doing. Well, the Madonna is Mrs. Coulter, and I think my mother, when I put the hand there, and the aunt is busy. That's easy, that's the top meaning. And the hourglass has got time in its meanings. And partway down there's now, and I just fix my mind on it. And how do you know where these meanings are? I kind of see them, or feel them rather, like climbing down a ladder at night. You put your foot down and there's another rung. Well, I put my mind down and there's another meaning, and I kind of sense what it is. And then I put them all together. There's a trick in it, like focusing your eyes. Do that then, and see what it says. So she does. What Mrs. Coulter doing now is given as an example of the kind of questions Farrakhorn would supply for Lyra to ask. And he has her talk him through her process, almost as if it's the process rather than the particular answer he's really interested in. And in developing his own understanding, as well as Lyra's. We get another take on the night fishing idea, only it's more active in her answer to where these meanings are, like climbing down a ladder at night. Several other metaphors follow, focusing your eyes, learning to fly, and another's implied in Father Coram's study of Lyra's study of the alethiometer. There's an allusion to chess. He sees how she looks along lines of influence, probably not something she herself could explain, much as she was, was not aware she was asking a question in the first place about the spies, though he noted it. Last, there's a comparison to a magnetic field, which may remind us of the north, the pole, also of Mrs. Coulter, who's been connected with electrons and her anger with amberic power. Their almost miraculous progress so far is pulled up short here by a symbol that doesn't seem to make sense, though Lyra doesn't say why. The needle stopped at the thunderbolt, the infant, the serpent, the elephant, and at a creature Lyra couldn't find a name for, a sort of lizard with big eyes and a tail curled around the twig it stood on. They repeated the sequence time after time while Lyra watched. What's that lizard mean, said Father Quorum, breaking into her concentration don't make sense. I can see what it says, but I must be misreading it. The thunderbolt, I think, is anger. And the child, I think it's me. I was getting that meaning for that lizard thing, but you talked to me, Father Quorum, and I lost it. See, it's just floating any old where. Yes, I see that. I'm sorry, Lyra. You tired now? Do you want to stop? No, I don't, she said. But her cheeks were flushed and her eyes bright. She had all the signs of fretful overexcitement, and it was made worse by her long confinement in this stuffy cabin. This time, Father Quorum does not look closely enough himself for an important hint. The tail curled around the tree. He intervenes again. His question this time, and his giving in the pity which follows, is nearly disastrous in the short term, but we'll see if good comes out of it yet. To be fair, Longer study in the stuffy cabin might only have led to even more deleterious effects on Lyra, souring her on reading, giving the spies more time to come closer. Who knows? We're invited to think about it, with all the recriminations and repentances surrounding this decision. Well, I don't suppose it'll matter for just a few minutes in the open air. I wouldn't call it fresh, tint fresh, except when it's blowing off the sea. But you can sit out on top and look around till we get closer in. Lyra leaped up, and Pantalaimon became a seagull at once, eager to stretch his wings in the open. It was cold outside, and although she was well wrapped up, Lyra was soon shivering. Pantalaimon, on the other hand, leaped into the air with a loud caw of delight, and wheeled and skimmed and darted, now ahead of the boat, now behind the stern. Lyra exulted in it, feeling with him as he flew, and urging him mentally to provoke the old tillerman's cormorant demon into a race. But she ignored him and settled down sleepily on the handle of the tiller near her man.
Pan's call off delight. He's getting to stretch his wings as a seagull. Parallels Lyra's delight with learning to read the symbols, as we're told, like learning to fly. It's also much simpler and more visceral. Even when you consider their connection, it stops short of telepathy, but it conveys feelings back and forth, exalting and urging mentally. His flashing elegance against the dark sky might plant the seed for us to ask how far Pan can go from Lyra. It will be in the coming chapters that we'll see this question explored directly. The lightning bolt by itself might have given us a sense of foreboding, but when the attack comes, it is sudden, but not quite so dramatic as all that. As he soared up out of a dive with wide wings white against the gray, something black hurtled at him and struck. He fell sideways in a flutter of shock and pain, and Lyra cried out, feeling it sharply, Another little black thing joined the first. They moved not like birds, but like flying beetles, heavy and direct with a droning sound. As Pantalaimon fell, trying to twist away and make for the boat in Lyra's desperate arms, the black things kept driving into him, droning, buzzing, and murderous. Lyra was nearly mad with Pantalaimon's fear and her own, but then something swept past her and upward. It was the Tillerman's demon. Clumsy and heavy as she looked, her flight was powerful and swift. Her head snapped this way and that. There was a flutter of black wings, a shiver of white, and a little black thing fell to the tarred roof of the cabin at Lyra's feet just as Pantalaimon landed on her outstretched hand. Before she could comfort him, he changed into his wildcat shape and sprang down on the creature, batting it back from the edge of the roof, where it was crawling swiftly to escape. Pantalaimon held it firmly down with a needle-filled paw and looked up at the darkening sky, where the black wing flaps of the cormorant were circling higher as she cast around for the other. Lyra's rescued from that bitter shock by the unassuming Tillerman's cormorant demon, who had not de deigned to fly for pleasure, like how she was saved by Tony before. Part of her panic is her helplessness, as she felt in the nets, and before Pan can be comforted, he goes on changing and catches his attacker. As close as their connection is, then, Pan and Lyra have distinct aims here. In a reversal of the ferret demon speaking for her human, Lyra here thanks the demon's man. In his tin mug and Farter Quorum's bit of card, there's a motif of using one thing for another purpose, very like spies or ninjas. Think about these everyday spying skills and start seeing the wondrous in the entry day. Literally so here. Let's go below and have a look. Take it careful, Lyra. Hold that tight. She looked at the Tillerman's demon as she passed, intending to thank her, but her old eyes were closed. She thanked the Tillerman instead. You ought to stay below, was all he said. She took the mug into the cabin where Father Quorum had found a beer glass. He held the tin mug upside down over it and then slipped the card out from between them so that the creature fell into the glass. He held it up so they could see the angry little thing clearly. It was about as long as Lyra's thumb, and dark green, not black. Its wing cases were erect like a ladybird's about to fly, and the wings inside were beating so furiously that they were only a blur. Its six clawed legs were scrabbling on the smooth glass. What is it? she said. Pantalaimon, a wild cat still, crouched on the table, six inches away, his green eyes following it round and round inside the glass. If you was to crack it open, said Father Quorum, you'd find no living thing in there. No animal, nor insect, at any rate. I seen one of these things afore, and I never thought I'd see one again this far north. Afric things. There's a clockwork running in there, and pinned to the spring of it, there's a bad spirit with a spell through its heart. But who sent it? You don't even need to read the symbols, Lyra. You can guess as easy as I can. Mrs. Coulter, of course. She ain't only explored up north. There's strange things of plenty in the southern wild. So they take their look at it and the beer glass, <clears throat> Pan following it as he does the needle of the lithiometer, and as he remembered the photo mill whirling. So if we hadn't noticed yet, the spy fly is kind of parallel to the lithiometer. As opposed to its near uniqueness, the spy flies are multiple. 
Compared to its northernness, they're southern, or rather tropical, Afric things, which Mrs. Coulter has encountered on her explorations. And go with Lyra and Pan's discussion of how the alethiometer works, we get a similar line of thought from Father Coram, describing the clockwork, the matter, that drives them, but also the bad spirit pinned to the end. The problem posed by the spy seems insoluble, for destroying the mechanism will only set the bad spirit free. But rather than responding with gratitude, it will kill its liberator. At this fresh impasse, Father Quorum can only repeatedly call himself a fool for lack of anything else to be done now. Together, though, they finally figure out the meaning of the symbol they had no name for before. And no wonder it was tricky, for it's difficult learning to see air. The chameleon is said to live on air, just like the tree it's paired with. And the elephant for Africa. But perhaps also the alethiometer's wry joke on Father Coram's memory lapse here. Keeping the spy fly shut up is all they can do, which ironically is very much like the master's original instructions to Lyra about the alethiometer. But she has since chosen to share that, and we'll see later how she shares the spy fly. The other got away with news, though it's unclear how it will be communicated. And then they accomplish another transfer to smoke leaf tin repurposed twice over now, as it's been holding screws. There's a tricky moment, as indeed the introduction of the spy fly itself poses a tricky moment for the story. How can something like this be contained, this propensity to simply invent a new device whenever it's helpful to the story? This is one of Douglas Anderson's critiques, which I might have mentioned once before, shared in an in a, in a email with me. Uh, I think it's a tricky one, all right, but Father Quorum has an answer. As soon as we get about the ship, I'll run some solder round the edge to make sure of it, Father Quorum said. But don't clockwork run down. Ordinary clockwork, yes, but like I said, this one's kept tight, wound by the spirit pinned to the end. The more he struggles, the tighter it's wound and the stronger the force is. Now let's put this feller out the way. He wrapped the tin in a flannel cloth to stifle the incessant buzzing and droning, and stowed it away under his bunk. I take this to mean solder and the flannel, that so long as the story stays grounded in its world, so close to ours, these fantastic flights will be kept in check, used no more than absolutely necessary to wind the story up stronger. The spy fly, implacable piece of black magic as it is, can be contained by a simple tin of smoke leaf, made secure by a few minutes, patient soldering. Again, it makes an interesting counterpart to the alethiometer, so far the only really new technology that's been introduced. The clockwork and the spirit pin to the end might mean metaphorically something like a passage I'm reminded of somewhere in Kierkegaard, but I haven't been able to find it, where he speaks of something being pinned to the end of an argument about Christianity to anchor it. It might be eternal happiness's contingency on one's time on earth. It might be faith's dependence on consciousness of sin. At any rate, some consequent of essentially infinite significance, sustained, pinned to a weighty presupposition which does not admit of empirical demonstration. That seems to be the spirit pinned to the end of the spring which only gets more worked up the more it works. The ghost in the machine, the clockmaker god of deism, might also come to mind. And of course, Pullman's favorite among his works, the story Clockwork, which was released and presumably written between the time he wrote the second and third books of his Dark Materials, The Subtle Knife and The Amber Spyglass. And we'll spend some time in Clockwork for a recess today. Just to round off this chapter first, a couple of noteworthy details about the arrival in town. We hear about fish kippering in the smoke. We might remember this when we meet another child who's escaped the gobblers, hiding in a smoke house far to the north, clutching a smoked fish. With the air itself flavored, all the characters are sort of chameleons now, not only because of how they're trying to blend in, like spies, and specifically and repeatedly we're told how Lyra must hide her distinctive golden hair. Father Coram noticed her tuck it back while reading the alethiometer, as Will is going to later. These remarks upon the length and beauty and concealment of Lyra's hair connect her with Milton's Eve. Much more on this later. Last, we see the alert demons, 
but there's no one about. They're all cozy like the picture paper man, sipping Jennifer by roaring stoves. There's more bad news from Tony and John Fa. The death in the first half of the chapter is recalled here, along with Lyra's intention to sink the narrow boat, lending urgency to their departure. Her wonder at the full-size ship is brief, but it looks ahead to the next chapter. Pan becomes a monkey at once to climb, but, call, but she calls him down dutifully, and Lyra goes in, or below, on the ship, descending a ladder at night. The whole concept of going down, subtly back in the bilges uh, at the beginning of the chapter, and all over it, would be a good one to keep watching for, given its resonance with the fall with Jesus' death and resurrection, or any number of heroic descents to the underworld, from Dante's journey in the Divine Comedy to Lyra's own in the Amber Spyglass. And sure enough, who should we meet down there in the ship but the King of the Egyptians, doing nothing hastily, not reproaching either, not absolving. He too has heard of the clockwork devils, and knows it's no good either trying to turn it to good or to drop it in the sea. The only answer for now vigilance. There's a kind of echo here of the dilemma in Tolkien's fellowship about what to do with the ring. These eternal questions which we try ineffectually to destroy or cast aside at our peril. Whereas the alethiometer, like a demon, settles into a pattern of precise movements, the spy fly buzzes incessantly and moves its container erratically across the table. Its only message seems to be fury. It turns out Lyra will be the only female aboard the ship, not counting demons, as John Faw decided against taking women after careful thought. There's a bit of comic relief as we come to the close here. The fussy narrator tells us that Scuttle is the proper name for Porthole. Lyra goes up, uh, up, to, up on deck only to see that England has vanished already, ominously but humorously too, in the mist. The ship's lights are glowing bravely, and all Lyra feels is queasy. She decides to rest, for Pan's sake, of course. And so began her journey to the north, and so concludes part one. On to recess. It might feel like a long time ago that we ran with Lyra along the tables in the hall in Jordan, or since we snuck out of Mrs. Coulter's party, but we get a bit more sneaking and spying in the gameplay for this chapter of the imaginary adaptation. Besides going around pestering the different leaders as the roping is breaking up, and reading the alethiometer with Father Coram and by ourselves, we'll play through the demon story, Jacob and the others infiltrating the Ministry of Theology at Whitehall. This will include, though it isn't mentioned, seeing something of how Jacob and his demon managed to capture the gobblers, and then to get away after being struck with an arrow in the shoulder, stumbling or being carried back to Peter Hawker's boat. And as Peter... We'll get to navigate by secret ways back to the fens. It occurs to me it need not have been by any mode we've yet seen in the Golden Compass, since in Pullman's new companion volume in the Book of Dust, he introduces more Therian elements, such as underground rivers and river gods, with whom the Egyptians seem to be on good terms. We may see the boat resurface from a secret grotto just by the sugar beet dock, a waterway warp point you normally used for smuggling between London and the Fens. As for the other main action sequence in this chapter, after the interrupted reading of the alethiometer, Pan will get his seagull transformation, and you'll finally be allowed up on deck and in the air above it to play. The cormorant demon will have to rescue from the ambush, but then as Pan, you'll want to catch the spy fly that falls in a test of dexterity. Maybe managing it particularly elegantly will earn you the cormorant shape for Pan. Should you fail, we'd have to think of another reason for Lyra to keep a smoke leaf tin close by, some other dangerous object for her to keep in it. Let's suppose at this point, though, if you chose to ask Fodder Coram about Heidelberg back when he mentions it before, he'll say a little more when he curses himself for a fool, something like, that chameleon. I knew I'd seen it in the book. At this point, to help him take his mind off self-recriminations, maybe you'll have the option to tell Father Korm a story. It's about the clockwork, Lyra might say. 
and about his stories of Heidelberg and about how one thing leads to another. And then the player will be drawn into a mini-game based on Pullman's book Clockwork and play through some of the events recounted there. I know this inclusion of a major side quest which breaks the bounds of the actual story of the Golden Compass would be a lot to ask, especially if we're going to need the rights to draw on other Pullman's published works. But since we're just imagining anyhow, let's go with it. The game, as I'm conceiving of it, would be a kind of metaphor for the creative reading that we're doing of the text, drawing on associations to other works and ideas as we go. And clockwork is, in a sense, a story about this process, about the telling and reception of stories, about the interplay of creativity and morality, about the responsibilities of makers and rulers and ordinary people, and about the power of art and its relationship to nature. It's a brilliant, deeply moving little work, nearly perfect in its kind. Here's how it opens. A note about clocks. In the old days, when this story took place, time used to run by clockwork. Real clockwork, I mean. Springs and cog wheels and gears and pendulums and so on. When you took it apart, you could see how it worked and how to put together again. Nowadays, time runs by electricity and vibrating crystals of quartz and goodness knows what else. You can even buy a watch that's powered by a solar panel and sets itself several times a day by picking up a radio signal and never runs a second late. Clocks and watches like that might as well work by witchcraft for all the sense I can make of them. Real clockwork is quite mysterious enough. Take a spring, for instance, like the main spring of an alarm clock. It's made of tempered steel with an edge that's sharp enough to draw blood. If you play about it, about with it carelessly, it'll spring up and strike at you like a snake. Put out your eye. Or take a weight, the kind of iron weight that drives the mighty clocks they have in church towers. If your head were under that weight, and if the weight fell, it would dash out your brains on the floor. But with the help of a few gears and pins and a little balance wheel oscillating to and fro or a pendulum swinging from side to side, the strength of the spring and the power of the weight are led harmlessly through the clock to drive the hands. And once you've wound up a clock, there's something frightful in the way it keeps on going at its own relentless pace. Its hands move steadily round the dial as if they had a mind of their own. Tick-tock, tick-tock. Bit by bit they move and tick us steadily on toward the grave. Some stories are like that. Once you've wound them up, nothing will stop them. They move on forward till they reach their destined end, and no matter how much the characters would like to change their fate, they can't. This is one of those stories. And now that it's all wound up, we can begin. So as that text scrolls across and forms into little gears and springs and weights and pendulums, you can see that the whole aesthetic is shifting for this side quest game within the game like an animated version of the shimmering, soft-looking illustrations in the book drawn by Leonard Gore in the U.S. edition. Le Leonid Gore. The music will be variations on the melody. The Flowers of Lapland which has a prominent place in the story, and by the tick-tock, which, as uh, I think it's Kermode, a critic points out in a famous piece, is actually simply a relic of our own mind's perception of the tick-tick of clocks. You'll play through the unfinished story, the race through the woods, the climb up the clock tower, and when it finishes, Vodacorum will have cheered up considerably. As he's about to tell a story in turn, maybe one about witches. The boat arrives in town. It's time to board the ship. The land dissolves in mist, and the ocean swell rolls, and instead of clambering up the rigging, Pan will suggest you go lie down. With that, I'll let you go. Wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And until next time, take care. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. 
It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.